Hi, welcome to Hollywood Crime Scene. This is Rachel Fisher. Hi, this is Desi Jettikin. Let's uh, start off the show by thanking our most recent Patreon contributors. This week we had Samantha, Gina, Lisa, Caroline, and that's it. Oh, thank you guys. Thank you guys so much. So sweet. Yeah. Uh, so people on the Facebook page are dying to hear our thoughts, and <laughs> our thoughts on the f on the finale of the assassination of Gianni Versace. And obviously we have thoughts, right? We have lots of thoughts about it. I do agree. Some people were talking about the um, Ultra Vox song. Yes. I, that is one of my favorite things that of the series, like the music choices, I think have been really He did a good, good job with a lot of that. the music. I mean, I realize that's not the major point of the show, but I do feel like I always step away from each episode liking a moment with a song. Right. And that was definitely an effective use of that song there in was particular. A, there was a D-Light deep cut. Oh, God, the D-Light. Yeah. The Runaway. That was, <laughs> which is like, that was amazing. Yeah, of course, Desi knows that song. <laughs> Of course. Um, of course. So I, I appreciated that. And also, I really liked the finale. I liked the finale, too. I still don't think the backward time thing worked, ultimately. Like, gonna... I can see what they were doing, but I feel like if I'm the whole time not liking it, it wasn't, it didn't work. Right. I understand Like, you that. can say at the end of the episode, like, oh, now I get it, but... If you you hated it the whole time, then I don't feel like it did its job. That's a good point because I actually had this revelation <clears throat> watching the finale and thinking, oh, I get it now. I get why they went backwards from a storytelling perspective because it forced you to feel something for Andrew Cunanan at the end because it was only – an episode before that you saw his childhood. Right. I get that too, but that's not why they say they did it. Why'd they say they did it? I didn't read any reviews uh, on it. Well, I just listened to an interview with them yesterday, I guess. I don't know who it was. Some of the producers yeah. of the show or from the series. Uh, um, they said they did it because they felt like they had to um, start with what everyone knew otherwise we wouldn't know who andrew Cunanan was and be, wouldn't be drawn in but at the same time if the whole series i'm thinking i don't like this right then it's not really effective right i should have been i should have been on board I, okay let's go through the episode though ultimately i did like the uh, finale i think there was some really overblown <laughs> moments in it which i feel like has kind of peppered throughout the whole series these yeah. moments where you're kind of like oh come on like we don't have to really go that far like him shooting the tv when his dad <laughs> i don't buy it like right that was well i mean believable. obviously they had to make up all of his final moments because nobody knows what right. happens like right. other than like the dog food and like things like that where they can Wait, say i didn't see that's when i was watching it i was cringing because anytime anyone eats dog food i'm totally gross i out. always try to think like how hungry <laughs> i have to be well i liked that when he went for the dog food at first he was like no i can't do it and he threw it up. Right. That's believable. That's believable. Did he really, was he really eating dog food in there? Uh, I, I wanted to I heard know something where I feel like there are certain things they can tell because right. there's evidence left behind. Right. A can of dog food is open. Obviously all of his thoughts, it's all speculation. Like, did he watch the funeral? Did he see his dad on TV? Or his like mom. the dad, the dad on TV, that did really happen. Yeah. The dad, I know the like dad all did. of that kind of stuff. Like, so I do feel like it was a tricky episode because it's mostly Andrew watching TV. Yeah. And like by himself. So I feel like he did a good job uh, acting wise. Yeah. His acting was great as it has been the whole season. Right. So there were some things that did not happen. Uh, one thing I read was in this show, he did like a warning shot. I was wondering. And that's about not that. true. Okay. He didn't. There was only one shot and that was him killing himself. Right. Uh, and the reason they know this is because he he used Jeff's gun to kill himself. Jeff Trail. Yeah. Wow. And every bullet was accounted for by each murder. Yes. So they can literally count the bullets and know that he never did the warning shot. Yeah. Because, I mean, that kind of, I feel like that's such a creepy um, diary. The fact that each shot was accounted for. Right. Like, I don't know. Right. It's just kind of creepy uh, aspect to me. The other thing I really liked was, what's the guy's name, Ronnie? Who was that? He's the 
I guess he's a junkie, the gay guy oh, yeah, in the police interrogation. Good. I also like, I mean, that's another scene that I did really like, but at the same time, it also was hammering home the theme a bit. Yeah. Uh, but I think the theme is a good one to explore. The show was correct in focusing on Andrew Kananen and focusing on the idea of what it was like to be deeply ashamed of who you were to and kind of living a lot. Yeah. yeah. And to be living a lie and numerous on numerous fronts. Well, he felt like he had to be the exceptional gay man. Right. Right. So, uh, I'm going to end the series. I'm not going to end my commentary right now, but <laughs> as a whole, I feel like the Versace storyline was like so much weaker. It was so weak. I almost feel like it was only there to let us know why we're watching Kunanan's story. Do you know what I mean? And like, it's interesting because I, I did look on Twitter to see what people thought. And so many people are like, oh, I don't care about Andrew Kunanan. I just want to see about Versace. And for me, it was the opposite. I Yeah, I don't get that criticism at all. Like I remember early on people saying, why is it even called – assassination of Versace or Gianni Versace. Well, because no one... And I was like, who would watch? I mean, I would. I, <laughs> but like, I, I would too. Yeah. I mean, I get why. That title thing never bugged me because I got why. And it's not It's not like a, a trick. Like, it right. is about that. That is how right. he got famous. And in a way, like, it's sort of... Um, it is this thing that brought him this fame. If he yeah. had not killed Versace, we wouldn't know who he was. And right. I feel like that is ultimately another part of the the puzzle to this show. Yeah. Those other people's lives were just as valid. Yes. And because he was gay and they were often gay, uh, it, no one cared. Or it was just like, whatever. We're not going to invest that much time in, in this gay lover thing gone awry. Like, do you know what I mean? Which like, is actually... Until Versace was killed and then it became important. Which is actually, surprisingly enough, a theme sort of of tonight's main episode, and we'll get into that okay. more. Um, but, uh, you know, just the police attitudes towards certain groups of people. Right. And that's not just gay men, but no, you know, but sex that, workers and a lot of yes. different groups. But uh, so overall, I do like the themes. I do feel like it had standout episodes. And in general, it's something I would recommend people watching, Absolutely. even though I had problems with it. Uh, the other thing I thought was good was seeing judith light again She's although i don't fabulous. quite like i don't quite there was, look they brought, I, I, they, it was like not the perfect i feel like it was a little too much of her they brought her in because it was judith light judith light right like you, they had to bring judith light back because she's such a big name they didn't have to bring her back in my opinion i honestly feel like all we needed from her was her being happy and I like the scene where she talked about her husband's, the letters, and where she said yes. something like, what did she say? He never told me. He never told me Like, that. I feel like that's, like, poignant because it is hitting on the theme of the show. Right. These people who are living these closeted lives. I mean, I think a lot, about, a lot of the show was about the duality of human beings and, like you said, the things that they choose to tell the world. Well, did you... I mean, the other cheesy thing in the Versace storyline was the suicide of his lover... I don't know that that's true. He didn't commit suicide. Well, I mean, even attempt though. I don't even know no. that he attempted to. No. And even like the ha hand, like you know, the handful of pills. Well, the handful of pills, but when the priest touched his hand. Yeah. I mean, it was just kind of like. I think that's like this could be like a criticism I have for Ryan Murphy in general. I always like his subject matters, and I feel like I should be his number one fan. <laughs> and in general, I do like. 75% of what I'm watching. Yeah. But there's always these things where it's like, oh, come on. Like, why did you have to do that? Like, haven't you it's learned? Like a little over there's the always like a little bit like making sure we get it. And it's like, we're smart. We get it. Like, I don't need ham fisted. Yeah. Imagery. And I feel like that's just like an overall note I have for Ryan Murphy. I'm sure he's listening. You don't have to go that far. We get it. Like, I will say about Ricky Martin, I thought he did a fantastic job. Yeah, I liked him. And I only want good things for Ricky Martin as a human being. I like Ricky Martin, and I did hear somewhere that he and the guy who played Versace are really good friends in real life, and oh, cool. uh, that's why I think their scenes were so good together. They were great together. Yeah. They had great chemistry I liked for, together. By the way, I liked everyone in Versace's storyline. I thought the actors were all really good. I just feel like that storyline was almost a throwaway. Like I, I don't know yeah. what they could have done differently, because I do feel like they had to kind of feed that Versace storyline or give something on it, obviously. Well, it's but just, it does seem like it was like 
just sort of like someone on our Facebook page mentioned, and I agree with them that I think it was the final scene of the series where it's back in that flashback of that sort of dream of Versace and Kunanin oh, God. in the opera house in San Francisco. But there another are... one? You mean the one from this episode? From this past episode. Oh, yeah. That was terrible, too. I don't like that. Yeah, I, I didn't need that. And also, they didn't, it didn't seem dreamlike enough because that didn't really happen. Well, I don't know why they kept, I guess we were supposed to know at that point that anything in the opera house is not real and it's a fantasy, but I just don't know what it brought. Yeah. I don't know why. I didn't think it was a necessary scene. Um, I don't know. There was so much I liked. It was really, it was a chilling episode, I would say. Like, it was watching Andrew break down for me and watching him have right. this crisis inside the boathouse was chilling. Honestly, I feel like the only episodes I really didn't care for were, like, the first two. Or I agree. Was it the third one was the Judith Light one? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. After that, I liked everything. Me too. And I feel like it was just the first few the first that two, I didn't care I didn't, for. I didn't, I didn't get it, especially the first episode I didn't like. Right, um, right. It wasn't tense, but this was a tense episode. This was, like, very... I was on the edge of my seat, even though I knew the outcome. I knew, right. but that's what I feel like true crime stories that are fictionalized right. for film and television should do is even if you know the outcome of the case, you should still feel on the edge of your seat. Well, there were some things I also didn't know about Kunan and like uh, that he really was trying to escape Miami. I didn't know that either. Right. Like, I mean, I, I didn't realize how long he was kind of trying to get out of there and yeah. just couldn't. And I also, I mean, this is probably so ignorant, but I didn't realize Miami was so difficult that it's very easy to cut off a freeway to get off that island. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, I didn't know that. Either. Yeah, I didn't know that. So that kind of was like, oh, that's crazy. Like he literally was stuck there. Like he couldn't do anything right. to escape. And he had to kind of, it was like a caged animal yeah. just trying to figure out what he could do about it. Yeah. Um, and I, I, even though I know that they had to make up what Andrew did, it seems believable it, to me it, it that he watched uh, the funeral and was, you know, in the news, in the news see and see himself and... there. Like, um, but why do you think he killed himself ultimately? Um, that's, I think that he killed himself partially because of, just the mania of being holed up in there, <laughs> hunger. He probably wasn't sleeping. He no, he he had no way out. He had no way out, and he I think I think partially killed himself because he was in a complete and utter state of mania. Do you think he had any regrets about what he had done? Um, I do. I don't think that. I think Andrew Cunanan has a lot of is like a sociopath and has a lot of sociopathic tendencies, but I do think at the end of the day he does know in the bottom depths of his black heart there are some things that are right and wrong. I guess maybe it was just Darren Chris's portrayal of that. Right. I think um, because you did see his humanity in this episode. Andrew Cunanan's. How? You mean just, that he was suffering? That he was suffering, I yeah. guess. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I think Darren just did such a good job. It's like. Well, it's, he brought so much as, to as it. As much as um, he is a horrible person, I think you do always think what brought someone to that point. Yeah. And then to see his dad, some people also commented on the music choice of The Man I Love. Yes. Uh, so that does sort of seem like it's like nailing home that, I don't know. I mean, it's sad. It's just a sad story all around all around in so many different ways. I mean, there are so many different things about this entire case that make it tragic and make it just so sad. And and I mean, Andrew Cunanan is someone who was seeking approval from his father and from the entire world and right. going about it in very dishonest, sneaky right. ways that hurt a lot of people. I think that was the other um, thing I was thinking about where you kind of see – how one death affects like something like he kills Versace and it's like, yes, this loss to the world of a fashion designer and da da da. Right. But even just 
this guy's life was ruined, Ricky Martin. I can't remember the boyfriend's name. What is it? Antonio? Yeah. I uh, sorry, no. I forgot. But his life was ruined by that. Right. I mean, not ruined, but like he lost everything. Yeah. And, and that's also like a, a sort of a gay tragedy, <laughs> like where you don't have, you didn't, you not, you used to not have these rights as a couple. You know not I mean? even until very, very recently. Yeah, so I mean, it's like that's just another thing that illustrates. I thought about that too. I'm like, this guy wasn't legally married to him, but he was every much his husband right. as anyone else was. And they probably would have been married Absolutely. If, if it was a legal I thing. mean, this uh-huh. was a relationship that spanned decades. They were husband and husband, in my opinion, right. even though the law didn't recognize that. And, it, you know, they did sh- intersperse a few real life clips, like they showed clips of Princess Diana at the wedding, right. which that gave me chills, too. Right, because she dies she, two months later. Yeah. And and just like what you were saying, like this one death, Versace, did affect so many different lives. They showed a brief clip of Naomi Campbell crying on a tv interview good no, i'm just kidding <laughs> i love naomi campbell uh, but i just seeing her crying made me really sad because it was like this was her friend and now her right. friend has been murdered well i feel like honestly when i'm coming away from the, this is like beyond the whole gay rights kind of thing that was hammered home which i do like and i think is an important story to have people see uh and if true crime gets them into that then that's really good Um, I also really liked, um, fuck, I completely lost my train of thought. Uh, oh, I liked learning about the victims, the other victims. I thought that that was important because you're right. Like you said before, it's like Versace's death did overshadow. It helped their cases get solved in a way, but at the same time, they were never really the focus. I didn't know about no, I didn't the either. names of his victim, I other didn't victims. I didn't know their stories. I knew there were other victims, but I didn't right. know their stories. So I like that aspect of it too. I think, I think as we've talked before, those were the most poignant episodes often. Overall, it was a good show. And I think I, there have been pieces written. I haven't uh, read them yet about why this was less popular. Oh, than OJ? Than OJ. Mm-hmm. Um, but I thought it was solid. Overall, I thought it was solid. There were lots of things I didn't like, but I did enjoy watching it. I, I did too. I was sad when it ended, actually. I was like, oh, I don't have another episode. Even though we, <laughs> even though there's so many things we bitched about, I feel like we bitched about so much, but I did enjoy watching it. I did too, especially after the first two episodes. Yeah. Definitely. And this episode was good. So. Yeah, very good. I yeah. would give it a solid A. Yeah. For effort. I give it A for <laughs> effort too. So this week, I um, learned all about a serial killer I did not know about, have any real knowledge of, that was in Los Angeles uh, murdering people in the late 70s and early 80s. He was part of a trio that at first was just thought to be one person known as the Freeway Killer. Uh, I had heard about the freeway killer before, right, me too. but I learned that it, that freeway killer is actually three different people. And this gentleman, why do I call He's not a gentleman. gentleman. This fucking asshole. <laughs> these folks. <laughs> these folks. This guy, William Bonin is one of them. The other two are, uh, Richard Kearney. I think his name is James Kearney. James Kearney. I can't remember. It's a Kearney. Kearney yeah, is his Kearney. last name. Patrick Kearney. Patrick Kearney. Yeah. Whatever. He's a Kearney. We're going to get to them probably. But eventually. we are. Yeah. And then Randy Kraft. Right. Who's the other guy? Randy. Ugh. Ugh. It's always a Randy. It's always a Randy. (laughs) So this guy, William Bonin, this is who we're going to talk about today. And um, uh, the book that I read, I just want to give a shout out to the book I read this week so you guys uh, know. William Bonin, The True Story of the Freeway Killer by Jack Rosewood. It was was good. I I recommend it. So... Uh, William Bonin was born January 8th, 1947 in Willimantic, Connecticut to Robert and Alice Bonin. He was the middle child of three boys. Both of Bonin's parents were alcoholics and his dad had a gambling addiction. Mm. The children, they often went hungry and had to rely on their neighbors for food. And sometimes the kids were left with their grandfather, who was a convicted child molester. (laughs) And of course the parents knew this. Right. And... They wanted to go drinking or, you know, the dad would be gone for a long time uh, gambling. And or, it's hard to get 
childcare sometimes. It's hard to get childcare. Got to leave him with the, with the pedophile grandfather. Ugh. So, you know, it wasn't ab- absolutely confirmed that the kids were being molested by grandpa, but I, I would say that the chances. the chances are pretty high with that. So when William was six years old, he spent some time in an orphanage, actually. Jesus. Yeah, like his parents were just really <clears throat> not around. And when he was 10, he ended up landing in juvie for stealing license plates. So he just, ha- from the gate. Yeah. Not a good childhood. Um, and it was in juvenile hall that he was molested by older kids that were in there uh-huh. as well as staff members. Ugh. Never had a chance. And after he was released from the detention center, Bonin went on to molest his own brothers Ugh. as well as other young boys in the neighborhood. When Bonin was in eighth grade, his family's home was foreclosed upon, so they all moved out west to California to start their new life. He graduated from high school in 1965 and went on to serve in the Vietnam War, and he served in combat. And during his time in Vietnam, he sexually assaulted two of his fellow fellow soldiers at gunpoint. Jesus. Yeah. He actually was honorably discharged, though. For he was discharged because of what he did to them? No, just okay. when he... <laughs> I was like, that's crazy. No, I mean that when when he left the army, he he was honorably discharged. Like, they didn't find out about... I or see. they didn't... Whatever. Like, the guys didn't report it. But he right. did, you know, hold these two men up at knife point... Cut. Or, excuse me, gunpoint and molest them. So this guy's been on a molesting tear since he was a kid. Probably, do we need to do like a trigger warning or a warning of some sort? You know what? (laughs) We do, actually. And thank you for reminding me because I was thinking that the whole time I was researching this case, uh, this is one of the more gruesome cases that we've talked about. This is pretty heavy stuff. I will offer a trigger warning. I apologize I didn't offer that already. I mean, hopefully if you tune into this show, you know it's we talk about some pretty heavy stuff here. So uh, this uh, story involves a lot of child abuse and Uh molestation throughout the whole story. If that's something you're uncomfortable with, I would turn this episode off now and come join us next week for something different, probably. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And obviously, Desi and I, you know, we don't victim joke about victims here, but we will be roasting this motherfucking asshole William Bonin over the coals because he sucks and he deserves to have his name dragged through the mud because he's a terrible person. So with that, let's continue. Bonin, uh, after he was discharged from Vietnam, he returned home to California to Downey, which that's in Los Angeles County in 1968. And he moved in with his mother. He ended up getting married, but that marriage only lasted about two years. Uh, during the next year, Bonin abducted and sexually assaulted four different teenage boys Jesus. during that next year. He was arrested in 1969, and he was sent to the psychiatric hospital where he underwent evaluation. It was in the hospital where Bonin was diagnosed with manic depression. Doctors were aware of Bonin's sexual trauma, and they concluded that he was a sexual predator, so he was sent to jail in 1971, but he was released in 1974. And the doctors said at the time, well, we don't think he's a danger anymore to others. We think he's rehabilitated. Mm-hmm. So they released him. Big mistake. Yeah. Huge. It wasn't long before William Bonin was back on his bullshit again. I'm sorry. That's what I wrote in my notes. <laughs> I was trying to be concise. <laughs> At the end of the summer in 1975, 14-year-old David McVicker was hitchhiking in Garden Grove back to his home in Huntington Beach. William Bonin picked him up. At first, everything seemed fine. William seemed like a pretty nice guy. He tried to make conversation with David. Are you gay? He asked the 14-year-old boy. David obviously felt uncomfortable with this grown-ass man asking him such a personal question. So David asked, let me out of the car. Please let me out. But instead, William Bonin pulled out a gun and drove out to a secluded field where he raped David. During the rape, William Bonin attempted to strangle David with a T-shirt, but when David screamed, Bonin stopped, apologized, and drove him home. 
I can't believe he had the audacity to be like, oh, I'm sorry. Right. Like, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm grateful because obviously this uh, person survived. Yes. But it is true. It's like, well, what's your, I, I mean, it's like a fascinating detail. It, it was like, so fascinating. Because he me. hadn't killed anyone yet. No. Probably. He so just, he was still. He was a molester. He was kind of dipping the toe in of pushing that line. Right. right? So something spooked him or some <clears throat> split decision. Well, I think a lot of times, sometimes their first murder is because they don't want to go back to prison, especially when they're a sexual predator and right. they've been in jail for, before. That's usually kind of how it happens. Right. So uh, Bonin did go to jail for this because David went to the police right. and they were able to uh, locate him, which is good. But he wound up only doing three years for the Jesus rape Christ. and attempted murder of David, even though he already had a history. He had a long history of doing this before. So William Bonin was released in 1978 and put on 18 months of probation. Oh my God. That's it. He moved back in with his mother and started working as a truck driver. And around this time, William Bonin met a 22-year-old man named Vernon Butts. Vernon, this is, you'll like this. Vernon was an aspiring magician. Okay. Yeah. And he was super into the occult. So I just like picture this is like, I mean, I guess this is like a, maybe, I don't know, like a couple of years before Dungeons and Dragons, but Vernon kind of right. seems like that type of guy to me. I've, like whenever I hear descriptions of him. Right. That maybe he was into that. I mean, not all Dungeons and Dragons players. I'm just saying. I just want everyone to have a picture of this guy. Yeah, please don't add us. <laughs> don't add apply me, Patton Oswalt. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, let's see. But I mentioned like the, uh, you know, he was into the occult dark magic stuff. Right. So this Bonin thought that this guy would be a good mark for him to sort of team up with, basically. Oh. Uh, so at this party um, where Bonin met Vernon Butts, he's like, hey, you know, you should be my accomplice uh -huh. uh, in my crimes. We should do crimes together. And Vernon was into it. He's like, yeah, that sounds good, Did he good, know man. what the crimes were? Um, I don't think it really mattered to him. I he think that Vernon was just looking to get into any kind of trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm sure that, you know, because he did get into these crimes with, uh, that had to do with sexual assault, he probably already was into that stuff. Right. Already. So Vernon is a bad person. Vernon's a bad guy. Okay. Yeah. Cause I didn't know if I was allowed to make fun of his name. <laughs> Oh, I when you first to. mentioned his name, I was like, I don't know if that's a victim, so am I allowed to say? No, I, believe me. <laughs> every time I had to write his stupid fucking name down, Vernon Butts. When you first said it, I was like suppressing a laugh because I was like, well, I don't know if that's going to be a victim because I literally know nothing about the case. Yeah, no, and I was like, worry. okay, Vernon Butts sucks. Okay, good. Yeah, ahead. he fucking sucks. So on May 28th, 1979, 13-year-old Thomas Lundgren left his parents' home in Reseda and hitchhiked. <sighs> There's a lot of hitchhiking in this story because right. this is the 70s and early 80s. The driver who picked him up was William Bonin. Bonin had modified his van specifically for murder and torture. The door handles on the inside had been removed to ensure his victims could not escape. Ugh. That is like, I mean, like I. So now he's, I'm, I'm a murderer. Like oh, once yeah. you, once you do that he, to your van, that's what I'm saying. He yeah. went to the trouble of like, I'm going to outfit my van to be a murder Ugh. mobile. Yeah. Like, <clears throat> I mean like that is like one of my, I don't know if it's a rational or irrational fear, but like getting into like an Uber or a Lyft and like the door handles are removed. I've totally had that thought before. Right. I mean, that's so scary. Yeah. You it, have to always check before you shut the door. <laughs> totally. So. Uh, inside the van also were knives and an assortment of ligatures. Mm -hmm. And Thomas's body was later found covered in stab wounds. <sighs> his testicles and penis had been removed. His throat was slashed and he had been strangled. So this is a pretty brutal murder for right. his first murder, which is kind of unusual because serial killers often will have, you know... A less extra murder than that right their first murder and it escalates from there do you know what the cause of death was was it the strangulation, strangulation. so the stab wounds were torture basically yeah like yeah he died from strangulation uh-huh bonin would later claim he didn't want to claim that thomas was his victim because he quote didn't cut little boy's dicks off oh 
Vernon? Like, no, Bonin. Oh, Bonin, Bonin. Bonin. So I love that that's the line for him. Like, right, yeah, he I, has some weird lines. Right, like, yeah, I raped him and stabbed him, but I didn't cut his dick off. What yeah. am I, a monster? Right. Like, that's his line. Yeah. So later that summer, William Bonin would be arrested again for molesting um, a 17-year-old boy. Just molesting. Uh, I hate to say just molesting, but he didn't murder right. him. obviously. It wasn't yeah. a murder. But because of a clerical error, he was released from jail. Ugh. Unbelievable, right? In August of that year, Bonin and Butts picked up um, Bonin and Butts, also known as like the worst police detective TV show in the 70s. Bonin and Butts. It it's like, like a John Holmes movie. Right. <laughs> so I'm just curious, has Butts been arrested for anything ever as far as molestation or no. anything creepy? Uh huh. So Bonin and Butts picked up 17-year-old Mark Shelton. Mark had been raped and brutalized by William Bonin. The teen was sodomized with a variety of foreign objects, Ugh. including a pool cue. Jesus Christ. Mark Sheldon ended up dying from shock, which I uh, didn't know was something you can do. Uh, that for Especially some, that age. Yeah. I mean, that's a young man. Young man. I mean, that's that's like the level of how bad that was the brutalization. Trauma- he was traumatized. Absolutely. And physically, I mean. Yeah. <clears throat> that's so horrible. So his body was found in San Bernardino County. The next day, William Bonin and Vernon Butts picked up 17-year-old Marcus Grabs. He was a student from Germany. This was the very next day. Mm-hmm. They already were like, let's do it again. Let's do it. So they pick up this kid, and um, this guy was just traveling to the U.S. for the summer, just going. So on. like an exchange. He was an exchange student, just doing a tour of the country, Ugh. and he was in California, in Los Angeles, and gets in the absolute wrong car. So on the evening of August fifth, nineteen seventy nine, Marcus was hitchhiking on PCH uh, Pacific Coast Highway uh-huh. for our non. Uh, Southern California listeners, when he was picked up by William Bonin and Vernon. Marcus was then put into the back of the van and taken back to Bonin's mother's house where the two men raped and tortured the teen. Marcus's nude body was found in Malibu Canyon. He had been strangled, bound with rope, and stabbed 77 times. Jesus Christ. That is a lot of times to stab someone. Yes. Uh, th- there's certain types of serial killers. There's the serial killers who do it for the effect that it gives them while they're killing. Like I forget right. the name of it. And they're then, in like a state. Like yeah, a, uh-huh. like they really like they like the process of killing. And right. then there's serial killers who do it out of convenience or out of necessity. Mm-hmm. Like oh, I raped this person. I have to kill them. Right. Um, and and William Bonin was the kind of guy. He his thrill came from the process right. of killing. So it makes sense that he would enjoy the torture and the intimidation and the sexual assault. And um, police speculated, at least in this book, that part of why the crimes were so brutal and the kills were so brutal is they thought, oh, William Bonin was ashamed of his uh, homosexuality and he had to stab them so brutally after he raped them. It's like killing that it's thing he didn't like about that himself. Urge he had inside. Right. That was there. That, that was just one. also almost like I, I have like obviously been around gay men my whole life, and I do remember like people. I had friends who would get beat up after like a an encounter, a sexual encounter, and it was sort of like a straight guy, supposedly, right. who beat them up afterwards because I mean they weren't killed obviously, but it was like this the shame in them. They had to beat up the person who tempted them, right. You know what I mean? As if it's their fault. By the way, I'm looking at this picture of Vernon Butts, and he's exactly what you would think he looks like. Let me see. Hold on. I mean, I've seen it, but I need to be... Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, he looks like a Vernon Butts. He does. And that's not a compliment, by the way. <laughs> we'll post his picture. Okay. So, on August 27th, I want you guys to just realize, like, I'm... You know, th- these murders are happening, like one after the other this right. is like the longest he went between murders was like two months at one point i mean so these are happening almost every week at yeah, this point uh-huh. yeah or every week every two weeks sometimes within you know like 
three in a few days. So this one happened August 27th, 1979. Uh, at around 1 a.m., 15-year-old Donald Hyden was walking on Santa Monica Boulevard in Hollywood, which is right here, right here where we're recording right now, um, not far from this kid's home, when he was picked up by Bonin and Butts. The two men spent the next several hours raping and torturing Donald. At around 11 a.m. that day, Donald's body was found in a trash can in Long Beach. His body was covered in bruises, burn marks, and he had been stabbed in the neck and genitals. There was evidence of trauma to his anus, and he had been strangled. <sighs> so this is this is his signature. This is one of his signatures. William Bonin's is like he does he does the rape, he does the torturing, and there's often foreign objects right. inserted. There's um, ligature marks found on the bodies and he prefers strangling as his method to kill William Bonin's vicious murder spree continued just two weeks after he murdered Donald Hyden Vernon and William Bonin were out on the hunt for new prey on September 9th 1979 17 year old David Marillo was riding his bike in La Mirada on his way to go see a movie when the two men spotted the teen and lured him into the van the men bound, raped, beat the teen, and three days later, David's body was found alongside the 101 freeway. The next murder happened eight days later. This was 18-year-old Robert Wirostek, and he was found dumped alongside the 10 freeway. It would be a few months before the duo struck again. This is like that long, that break. longish gap. And is there anything that you found out that caused the gap? Like, was there? Uh, no. Uh huh. No. Um. I mean, I mean, sometimes it's like, oh, that was the month his mom died and he had to go to <laughs> like, there's right. always usually some reason. No. And the thing about William Bonin is like he he acted on his urges. He may, might have just not had the urge or, or might months. not have seen someone. He really acted like when he had the urge to do it, he did it no matter what was going on. And then I don't know if this will be something you get to is Vernon participating in the kills uh, Vernon actually only killed, I think, two people Himself. at his own hand. Right. Right. But he was always there. He was when just it the account. He wasn't always there. There's some other murders that happened where he <clears> wasn't. <throat> but that this was William Bonin's first accomplice that he had. He was like his protege. So this guy would rape and torture. Yes, he would help uh -huh. him. He would help William with all the rape and torture. But it was always William Bonin's hands, and he was the ringleader with all of this. Right. So. Uh, the following day, um, oh, excuse me. It would be a few months before the duo struck again, like I just said. Right. On November 29th, the body of an unidentified teen boy was found dumped in Kern County, also with the same methods of torture, uh, rape, and strangulation. The following day, William Bonin and Vernon Butts picked up 17-year-old Frank Dennis Fox. His body was found on Ortega Highway, which is five miles east of the Five Freeway, with the signature ligature marks uh, found around his wrist and ankles. There were signs of beatings. And this time, they found avocado green colored carpet fibers in his pubic hair. This was the same color of carpet in William Bonin's van. Oh. Which I'm like, of course, it was fucking the avocado, avocado green. Know, that That's like so, so 70s. And, and what's going on media-wise? Are these uh, big stories? We're going to get to this. Okay. These okay. are not big stories. These are just blips in the paper. This body was found. Right. And we're going to get to why in a little bit. Okay. Because that's, I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah. So, uh, let's see. Uh, on January 1st, 1980, Bonin decides, I'm going to go on a solo kill. You know, it's New Year, New Year's Day. I'm going to... Resolutions. New resolutions. I'm going to go out and kill by myself. And so he picked up 16-year-old Michael Francis McDonald. And Michael's body was found fully clothed in San Bernardino. This boy would not be identified until several months later, though. So Vernon Butts wasn't William Bonin's only protege and accomplice. Bonin decides he's got to get like a few guys uh -huh. to help him it's sort of like this murder crew that he i assembled. can't even imagine asking someone to murder with you like that is such a risky <laughs> proposition right like it's always shocking to me that they find each other because there's obviously throughout the history of 
horrible people. There are these like murder duos and it's always fascinating to me that they found each other. I just don't, what do you like? How do you approach that subject? <laughs> like, like it's just this is something that happens. Like, I know. I mean, I don't understand. You just meet scumbags and you're probably like, they must. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's insane to I me. I can't imagine. Well, first I can't imagine even wanting to murder right, someone. Right, right, right. But I can't even, if it that. It seems risky. I How mean, do you is. even approach that subject? You don't just JK. Go, like it's like, oh JK, I was kidding. Like <laughs> just kidding. Yeah, I was or like, am I? Yeah. Just kidding. You're or just kinda I? like I mean, it's insane to me. I don't get it. So this was not his only protege. Bonin decided to team up with 19-year-old Gregory Miley for his next kill. And on February 3rd, 1980, these two men were out trolling in Hollywood when they spotted 15-year-old Charles Miranda hitchhiking on Santa Monica Boulevard. Again, right where we are right now. So Gregory Miley tried to rape the boy, but was unable to because his dick couldn't get hard. In a rage about his limp dick, Gregory Miley then decided to insert a variety of sharp objects into the boy's anus instead. And I just wrote in my note, this isn't the first or last time a man has done something absolutely terrible over insecurities about his dick. Right. Are are, um, they wasted? Like, is Bon an alcoholic and drinking and no. drugging during no. all this? No. Okay. No, they just like killing. Not that that's an excuse, but no. yeah. No, he's just like, that. That's this is how he gets off. And right. and it did, there was a lot of times in the book where it talked about how horny it made. Like, this was sexual gratification right. for him. He got off on he this sexually. He got off on this sexually. So William Bonin then strangled the boy to death with his own T-shirt using a metal bar attached to it as leverage to twist, twist it and right. make it tighter. That was That's another, a yeah, that mm-hmm. was another signature of William Bonin's is these boys were usually, they had been strangled by a t-shirt right. uh, with this uh, crowbar to use as leverage. So they dumped Charles Miranda's nude body into a downtown LA alleyway. And William Bonin then turned to Gregory Miley and said, I'm horny. Let's do another one. Oof. Like, oh, let's let's go get more French fries. Right. Just that casual. So a few hours later, after killing and disposing of Charles Miranda, the two men were out in Huntington Beach preying on their next victim. This time they found 12-year-old James McCabe. This was Bonin's youngest victim. This boy was just looking for a ride to Disneyland. Mm, That's so heartbreaking. I got to say this was so hard researching this case because it was just like the nature of it. And like this one, it's just terrible. Um, So they were able to lure him into the van. Yeah, we'll take you to Disneyland. And so the little boy got into the van and the two men drove him to a grocery store where they raped and killed him right there in the parking lot of that grocery store. Again, the boy's own t-shirt was used to strangle him. James's body was found three days later on February 6th near a dumpster in the city of Walnut. Rachel just said a Marco Rubio (laughs) water guzzle. I'm going to cut that out. So just over a month later, another body was found, 18-year-old Ronald Gatlin. So the place where William Bonin actually met Gregory Miley and Vernon Butts was at his neighbor's house named Everett Frazier. Everett, um, he was a friend and neighbor, and he Mm -hmm. would go over there when Everett would have house parties. And... So that's the company. Wait, what town was he in? Downey? Yes. Okay. In Downey. Mm -hmm. So he ends up meeting a new protege. Oh, my God. Like, who is this Everett Everett? guy? (laughs) He's having all these awful, awful people at his house to just party. And apparently Everett had no idea any of this was going on. But he's friends with all disgusting, horrible. I'm like, who are your friends? You got to get new friends. This is like... You have a really bad picker. To say the least. You might have the worst picker I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. I can forgive someone who has one friend. (laughs) Yeah. You have one friend who happens to be a serial killer. Fine. It could happen. But like this is just this is just suspicious to me. So Bonin meets this guy at this house party, and he's 17-year-old William Pugh, which first of all, (laughs) Everett, you shouldn't have a 17-year-old over at your house right. drinking and drugging hanging out with a bunch of Look, older men we need to sit Everett down 
<laughs> he ne- Everett needs to have an intervention yeah. about a lot of things. So, oh, I even wrote that in my notes. Why is his neighbor hanging out with all these young boys? Come on, dude. So Bonin offers to give Pew a ride home. <sighs> and on the way home, Bonin asked him if he wanted to fuck. So William Pugh says no, and he tries to get out of the car. But Bonin's like, oh, fuck that. You're not getting out of this car. So he grabs him by the shirt collar, and he drags him into the back seat. Bonin then proceeded to tell the teen how much he loved raping and killing little boys. And he even offered tips to Pew about how to dump the body. Then he dropped off Pew at his home unscathed. So he just did that to scare and intimidate him because right. I still think that Bonin wanted to work this guy and get him to be his accomplice. I don't – I mean, perhaps he chose not to kill him too because it was Everett's friend. He, My cat is literally climbing on top of Desi's <laughs> shoulder right now. She's it's one of those me. things where you're like, I have no choice but to help her. But otherwise, I'm going to get clawed to death because right. she's trying to climb up me. So I'm ho- I'm hoisting her fat ass up onto my she's shoulders. She's sitting on Desi's shoulder uh-huh. right now. Okay, I'm sorry. So where were we? She's so horny tonight. I know. I don't know what is going on with her. I'm so scared. Oh, my God. Oh, my. Throw me. Oh, my God. Can you Yeah, I'm going to. Hold on. I'm sorry. Stand by. Hey, hey, hey. She's going to injure me. Okay, thank you. You know what? <clears throat> She's like a porpoise. <laughs> she is like a porpoise. Okay. Okay, back to the very serious murder stuff. So he drops this guy off unscathed. He just wanted to smoke right. him, basically. And that's like another weird move. Because he's basically leaving a witness that he just confessed things to. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's like a lot of It's sort of trust. like, it's an ego, too. He yeah. thinks that that guy won't dare tell on him. Well, William Bonin loved talking about his kills to anyone who would listen. Right. And, you know, he only had a few people that he could tell. And right. he would talk. To- and clearly an Everett party was a safe place <laughs> to kind of do it. Right. This fucking party. But surprisingly enough, William Pugh was interested in linking up with Bonin. Oh, my God. So, I mean, like... <sighs> I like that there's like this moment for William Bonin where he's like, should I rape this person or should I make them an accomplice? (laughs) Right. Like like he's always like, I mean, that is so weird after what happened that Pew would be interested. I mean, these people are fucking disgusting. So on March 20th, Pew met up with Bonin to go on their very first kill together. Jesus. I can't even imagine. Right. Um, They abducted 15-year-old Harry Todd Turner. The boy was a runaway, and Bonin mm. and Pew were able to lure him into the van by offering to pay him $20 for sex. The boy was then raped and severely beaten. He was bitten on the genitals and then strangled. <sighs> Bonin and Pew dumped Harry's body into an alleyway. Two days later, police found the bodies of two more teen boys, 14-year-old Glenn Norman Baker, a uh, Barker, excuse me, and 15-year-old Russell Dwayne Rugg. Again, avocado green carpet fibers were found in both boys' pubic hair. Now, in the late 70s and early 80s, it wasn't just Bonin who was known as the freeway killer. There were two other killers at this time who were also killing people and dumping them near the freeway. But police, however, were unsure about labeling what were Bonin's victims the work of a serial killer, even though all of these signatures were all over it. And this is sort of like what I was talking about before with handling the Andrew Cunanan case. Um, The police actually um, said, well, there's the big gay community in Los Angeles and Orange County, so gay men could just get dumped and killed off the freeway all the time. Right. That was sort of their... It's like this hookup culture where they're doing this reckless behavior right that was their narrative that they had put together um also like i said before these were this story was like a blip in the newspapers right i'm surprised because these are young children that surprised me too and i think i mean i don't know the i don't know their home lives or race or anything they but it seems to me like a child being abducted 
would be news. So that's why I was wondering, are these kids like all runaways? Are they? Some of them were runaways. Some of them had had problems with the law. They were all. Uh, Not that wh- that excuses anything. No. I'm just wondering why they weren't focused on. Bonin had a type. They were all white boys uh, that were around, you know, his age in his formative years when he was being molested. Right. That was another theory was that, uh, you know, he was deliberately choosing young boys who looked like him mm-hmm. sort of as a teen mm-hmm. to enact all of the horrible abuses that were right. put on him. People, yeah. The police, they didn't want to label him uh, also as a serial killer because just a few years prior, the Hillside Strangler case had been bungled right. by the LAPD. Uh, if you guys remember that case, the Hillside Stranglers weren't caught in Los Angeles, they were caught by the Bellingham, Washington police. Because one of them had gone up there. Right. right? Kenneth. Kenneth, yeah, Bianchi. So the only media outlet at the time who covered this case was the Orange County Register. They were the first person to muse about there being a serial killer at work. So J.J. Maloney, he was the reporter that was covering this case. Uh He was the one who was interested right he was like something's up here yeah this is not just random bodies being dumped i feel like that's very common back then it was a, a reporter would be the one be putting the pieces together right and kind of yeah and this was this guy's story this was his like i'm gonna figure this out we're gonna you know this something's happening here that's really terrifying in los angeles right now in orange county and we can't just let this go by the wayside So J.J. Maloney recalls police telling him, uh, again, it's not unusual for gay men to end up dead on the side of the freeway. And it was J.J. Maloney who came up with the name The Freeway Killer. In an article, um, J.J. Maloney had said he believed they didn't want to get involved uh, and call this a serial killer case is because of the way they bungled the embarrassment, sort of, of bungling the case. They didn't want that pressure um, on them to have to solve another serial killer case. Right. Uh, they also um, didn't, you know, he speculated, this reporter speculated that police didn't want to put fear into the town, that there was another serial killer on the loose. Uh, so on March 24th of 1980, the OC Register, it broke the story, basically. And yes, there is a serial killer on the loose in Los Angeles and Orange County. Like these deaths that have been sort of pushed to the third page in a little paragraph Mm -hmm. individually are all connected connected to each other. So on April 11th, 1980, the nude body of 16-year-old Stephen Wood was found in an alleyway in Long Beach near PCH. Now, like most serial killers, methods of torture or killing escalate over time. And like I said before, William Bonin was pretty extreme from the beginning. Right. Which is crazy that he could even escalate from there. But yeah. he managed to. So on April 29th, uh, 19-year-old Darren Lee Kendrick was approached by Bonin and Vernon Butts. The duo was back yeah. at it again in a parking lot of the grocery store where this kid worked. The two men offered Darren drugs, and he accepted getting into the van. Bonin and Butts then served up their usual routine of rape and beatings, but this time they forced Darren to drink hydrochloric acid. Darren was eventually killed by Vernon Butts by an ice pick to the ear. Jesus Christ. So a step up. Right, for sure. If you can even imagine from their killings. His body was found the next day at a construction site in Carson. If you can believe it, Desi, William Bonin has had a girlfriend this whole time. What? Who doesn't know what's going on. What? Yes. Yes. He has a girlfriend. uh, And he's just, I mean, like, this guy has a job. He works as a trucker. So So it's a perfect... He knows all the freeways. He knows all the freeways, but also, like, uh, what I was going to say is, like, he has a job. He has, like, this full life beyond the killing stuff. Like, when is he spending time with her? That's what I was wondering. Like, You never spend time with me. (laughs) Like, I would love to 
hear her pedestrian complaints, right? <clears throat> like we girlfriend pedestrian. Where complaints. were you? You said you were going. You said you were going out to the bar for an hour, and you come home and right. you smell funny. Yeah. Oh my god. I, I just. I mean, I, I always feel bad thinking horrible things about these girlfriends and wives of these people, but it's like, how clueless are you or just accepting of their bullshit I just excuses feel like there would be so many questions like no where why where were you right until why did you come home at 7 a.m well i wonder if the fact that he's a trucker they do have odd hours he was could able be. to be like oh i have a late run i had a late run i got called in that could have been it also you don't have the access that we have now to get in touch with any someone right no matter what yeah so it's like There's hey no yeah yes Right. Oh my God. And it just seems beyond her stupidity or whatever. I'm shocked that he would want to have a girlfriend who could possibly figure things out. Do you know right. what I mean? Like, well, that was or be a, a witness. That's the other thing is this guy's fucking ballsy. Like he's telling people, random people he just met at a house party that he's a, not only is he a murderer, but he wants people to help him murder. Uh, the other thing I read was that apparently this guy had a very hypnotic way about him. Like, I don't know. I haven't seen any evidence that he was ch particularly charming. No, he looks like scum. I mean, when I looked at those two guys, I was like, that looks like guys. I'd be like, mom, please. <laughs> like, don't bring this guy home. <laughs> like, so, Desi, not only did William Bonin have a girlfriend, but he also had some side action going on, too. Uh, with women? With a guy. So he was, oh, with a guy. Yes. Okay. So he had an 18-year-old male lover named Lawrence Eugene Sharp. Bonin ended up killing Sharp because he got bored with him. He so he killed his lover? Yeah. Because okay. he literally, William Bonin said this, I just got up one morning and decided I was tired of him. Mm. So he fucking murdered him. I mean, if you think ghosting is bad. Yeah. That's like a whole other level. I would rather be. I mean, that's literally ghosting someone. Jesus Christ. <laughs> okay. Okay, guys. Okay. Uh, let's get back to this. So a couple days later on May 19th, Bonin was ready for another kill. He called up Vernon Butts, but Vernon wasn't into it. And Bonin decided he was going to go alone. Another solo kill. So Bonin picked up 14-year-old Sean King and raped, tortured, and killed him. Later, though, he went over to Vernon Butts' house to brag about the kill and what a great kill it was. And, oh, my God, you missed on this great kill. Right. Like he had just gone, like, hey, this is a new... I mean, in a way, I wonder if there was more of a thrill killing someone he knew, like... No, this was a separate kill. Oh, and a that. different one. Yes. Holy shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he, Sorry. he kills his uh, lover. And then kills someone else immediately. He kills someone else a couple days Jesus later. Jesus Christ. He wanted to take Vernon on this separate kill. He killed his lover by himself. Right. But a couple days later, okay. he's like, hey, Vernon, ready to go another kill. Like, they're going to Is play he golf. one of the most prolific serial killers? I mean, he, I feel like we're up to, like, 20 people now. Yeah, that's like, yeah, he really is. So uh, he, Vernon didn't want to go. He's not in the mood, man. I'm not in the mood to go killing today. Maybe tomorrow. Uh, so when Bonin did this kill, this 14-year-old, and he's important. He's going to come up again later, this uh, victim. Bonin just like, oh, I'm going to go over and brag to Vernon about it because he missed out on a really good time. Right. Like, this is all just. What is what it's Vernon's job or career or his story like anything on him like he's just loser. a loser okay yeah he's okay. Just, these guys are all just fucking yeah. losers <laughs> so i guess bonin was feeling a little butthurt that butts was like i don't want to go on this kill today with you so he goes out looking for a new protege jesus Christ. another is this one is his third yes third protege okay so william bonin then decides to recruit 19 year old james monroe a drifter who had a history of trouble with the law. So Bonin didn't ex initially tell Monroe that he was a killer and wanted to kill. He was going to sort of um, groom him a little bit for just work him, you know, become friends with him, get in his good graces. And because Monroe was homeless, Vernon's like, well, why don't you just come and move in with me and my mom? 
So we did. What does the mom do? <laughs> That's the other thing. There's a lot. There's no mention of the mom in this story. And that is a good point you bring up. What is the, okay, sweetie, have a good time. What is he telling his mother? I guess he's just coming and go going as he pleases. He doesn't have to do chores or anything at the house. Right. Like, So uh, Bonin also gets Monroe a job at the same trucking company. So he's like helping this guy out, getting him on his feet. Uh, James Monroe said, you know, Bonin seemed like a really nice guy at first. Uh, and then uh, Bonin, uh, here's another thing. So this is all going on. So Bonin, meanwhile, had been obsessively collecting clippings in the newspaper about the freeway killer. Which is such a cliche. It's I'm so sorry. Trump of him. <laughs> <laughs> like, he was so into his own bullshit. Right. He was so into his own case that he was going on. He even made a scrapbook out of it. <sighs> like, I feel like that's something you only see in the movies, but I guess right. this is true. Like, he right. actually did collect all of the stories about him. Uh, but Bonin wasn't the only one who was carefully following the papers. David McVicker, who, if you remember from back in 1975, was the one who had gotten away. The victim who oh, right. had sent Bonin to jail right, for a right, few right. years. He was following these this story oh. about the freeway killer. <laughs> oh. So David McVicker called the police and said, I know who the killer is. Jesus. Yeah. That's awesome. I know. I'm like excited right now. I, I know. <laughs> Now, at, at the same time, like not long after, 17-year-old William Pugh, one of Bonin's accomplices, was arrested for car theft. Oh, right, right, right. So while William is in police custody, he told them that he could give up the freeway killer for a deal. So one of the things that William Pugh told police was that the killer had newspaper clippings in his glove compartment. The man he was describing, of course, was William Bonin, the same man who had been arrested a few years earlier for the rape and attempted murder of David McVicker, the boy they had who had just called them to alert them oh who the killer God. was. I love this guy. <laughs> so the story, there's a huge fucking break. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> this is huge. So the police surveillance of William Bonin began. On June 2nd, 1980, Bonin and his new accomplice, James Monroe, the 19-year-old drifter, picked up 19-year-old Stephen Wells. Stephen had agreed to come back with the guys to Bonin's mom's house for sex. And at this point, James Monroe thinks this is just, they're just going to have sex. He still doesn't know. his <laughs> mom's house. I'm sorry. That's just so... <laughs> so wrong. There's so, there's so many levels of wrongness to yeah. this whole situation. So... They had sex with Stephen, and then after they had sex, Stephen was offered $200 to be tied up. Once he was tied up, Bonin began raping him and beating on him, uh, and James Monroe is like, holy shit. Yeah. What the fuck is happening? Right. Like, this is not, this is not I mean. yeah. a good situation. Mm. Um, and James realizes what's going to happen, basically. So Bonin then strangled Stephen Wells, and the men loaded up his body into the van and headed to Vernon Butt's house to brag. When they got to Vernon's house, Butts answered the door dressed as Darth Vader. What? Which I thought was an insane detail. First of all... He is a huge nerd. Yes. I mean, besides being a murdering scumbag, he's like... What the fuck? <sighs> These people are so gross. <laughs> I like, fucking hate them. I was so repulsed when I read that. Not like anything against Star Wars, but just like. But yes, that. no. I'm just <laughs> no, they're just, no, it's just like in the middle of the fucking day or whatever this is. This guy answers the door. What was he doing? Who? No one was there. He was there alone. What was he doing? Dressed as Darth Vader. These are things I need to know. Right. Vernon that's Butts. the creepiest thing about this guy is that he's alone in his house dressed as Darth Vader. I mean, if that isn't a sign that you're a fucking creep. <laughs> like, what the fuck? <laughs> Jesus Christ. I mean, it's taking me a chill. <laughs> <laughs> fucking horrifying. So uh, once they get inside, I, presumably he takes off the helmet. I don't know. Hopefully he does. He's I not think doing he the has voice. the conversation. Do you, think, do you think he's doing the voice? Who the fuck knows? I mean, Vernon Butts... <laughs> I want to punch his fucking face and like 
<laughs> Fuck him. So uh, when they get inside to his house, Bonin explained to James Monroe, yes, I am the freeway killer. And then he showed him the 21. Was he being called freeway killer now in the press? Yes. Okay. That was the. So now he's like saying it. Yes. Like I am. He's that like, person. I am the freeway right. killer. Ugh. Can you imagine hearing <sighs> someone say that to you? <sighs> that is so scary. It's so scary. Oh, I'm like scared to go to the car tonight. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Don't like get Brendan to walk me out. <laughs> Seriously. And this all happened like around here. I know. Too. It's really scary. <laughs> so then Bonin shows James Monroe 21 different ID cards of the victims. So he had saved them as right. trophies. Uh, then the trio went out to the van to show the kill off to Vernon Butts. So Stephen Wells, this guy they had just killed, they had just dumped him in a cardboard box, hauled him over to Vernon's house and showing him off like it's a, a common trophy like animal. Hey, look, yeah. Look what I did. Look what I just killed. So next, Bonin and Monroe drove to Huntington Beach to dump off the body behind a gas station. Then they got burgers at McDonald's. <sighs> just like that. I mean, and that's how – that this is how – William Bonin operated. It's like he did these insane, brutal killings and then would just dump them off. Right. Carelessly, like, like garbage. Yeah, I know. Let's get some burgers. Right. It doesn't seem like he took any care no. to be discreet. No. Did not give one single fuck. It's kind of infuriating that he got away with it being so careless. Oh like he was God. making, you know what I mean? Like, it makes it extra infuriating. Like the police could have caught him very early if they made so any careless. effort. Yeah. Right. So that night, Bonin threatened James Monroe that if he ever told anyone about who he was, that him or any one of his accomplices would kill him. Right. So James is fucking spooked. And just nine days after the murder of Stephen Wells, Bonin, he's ready for another kill. But police were on his tail. Literally, one night he was out hunting and police were following him in their car. Unmarked car. Unmarked yeah. car. And Bonin's out in his fucking van with the avocado green carpet. And police see him attempt to pick up five different boys. Why can't they arrest him at this point? Because he's just pulling over. Hey, you want to get in the van? I know, but don't they have the the fiber evidence? Does that not... I yet? guess that didn't they just had they had the two witnesses right and they have green car, they don't know about the van they don't know right. about I what's mean, inside the van yet. Uh, they don't know that that's from yeah. his van they don't I have guess. any reason to search his van yet basically. right they yeah. don't have that uh -huh. so but they have a name so they're on his tail right and they're following him so finally William Bonin gets a guy a kid to get into his van a 15 year old boy he drives this boy to a parking lot at the beach and begins raping him. As police, as police approached the van, Bonin began to strangle this boy. What? And Sorry, I'm like having a freaking out right here. <laughs> if police had been only a few minutes late, this boy would have been dead. So they stopped it. They stopped it in the nick of time. Like straight out of a movie they busted in through the doors and he was in there strangling he was in kid. there they see him in the act literally strangling <gasps> this 15 year old boy inside the van police found a ton of evidence the right. knives right. the torture implements <laughs> well he didn't do anything to no. hide anything and then they find Bonin's scrapbook full of newspaper clippings in the glove compartment, just like David <laughs> Jesus uh, or Christ. the other guy yeah. said, not David, the, uh, the accomplice. So that night, June 11th, 1980, Bonin was finally arrested for the murders. Oh, my God. While in custody, police worked on Bonin to get him to confess, but he wouldn't. Like, the just audacity. because I made a scrapbook doesn't <laughs> mean... <laughs> Just because you saw hey. him raping a kid in there. So it wasn't until... You're going to love this, Desi. It was, <laughs> I immediately thought of Desi. It wasn't until police received a letter from the mother of 14-year-old Sean King urging Bonin to tell them where the body of her son was that Bonin finally cracked. No, he did not crack because he was empathetic to the mother just <laughs> wanting to have some closure. He cracked because he knew that if he went... 
got to go out in the police car to show them, to lead them to the body, that they might take him out for a burger. What? <laughs> and so... All I because, honestly hope they did not take him to get I a burger. I hope they didn't take him to get a fucking burger. Okay. But that's why he cracked... He confessed to these murders because he wanted a fucking burger. Look, just because I've gone to in and out seven times in the past week... <laughs> Doesn't mean I'm obsessed with burgers. And look, I get that. I get wanting a burger so bad you'll do anything, but this is over the top even for look, me. Look, if you're going to have to confess eventually anyway, you might as well try to get a burger first. <laughs> it could be your last good burger. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I want to know where they went for the burger too. Right. Because was it just like Jack in the Box? Because <laughs> that wouldn't do it for me. So, but I, again, I hope he didn't get it. I hope he didn't get it either. But fuck I love him. that that was, yeah, fuck him. I mean, I hope that they were like, yeah, we'll get you a burger. And then they drove by and went, yeah. whoop, and didn't And do just it. let him smell like the burger smell. Oh, no, I hope they got burgers for themselves. Oh, yes. And ate it in the and car. And they're like dripping. And they're like, mm, it's mm, so, so good. juicy. And then they're like, we got you one too. Oh, just kidding. And they Protein style. <laughs> yeah, that would be the ultimate insult. Yeah, we'll get you a burger and it yeah. lettuce wrapped. Oh, it's like a veggie burger from McDonald's. It's like the worst type of veggie burger. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, what an asshole. I fucking hate him. Dude, he has to be one of the sickest, most... Just the fact there's, like, <laughs> literally no remorse no, at all. None. None. I mean, I feel like that's common with a lot of serial killers. But sometimes I feel like they at least don't want to get caught, which can kind of trick you into thinking it's remorse. Like, right. he doesn't even he doesn't even try to hide it. No. I mean, it's infuriating that he got away with it so long. Oh, my God. So he confesses to 21 murders, and he told the police in great detail how everything went down. That's why we have all this all record. this record of this stuff. And also there was a ton of physical evidence. I mean, in the car, like they were able to tie him to all of this stuff too, just based on the evidence. Like his semen was found. Uh, uh, there was blood in the van. There were his hair is attached to the bodies. So, I mean, it was like, again, sloppy, sloppy, sloppy work. Like he just right. had no regard right. for anything. And again, Bonin, while he was confessing, he showed no signs of empathy when describing the brutal rape and murders that he carried out. In fact, talking about the kills filled him with glee and He uh, liked telling people finally. He loved it. Yeah. He totally got off on that. And uh, then Bonin decides to tell police all the names of his accomplices. Oh. So Vernon Butts was arrested on July 25th, 1980. Uh, meanwhile, James Monroe had stolen Bonin's car and fled to Michigan, but he was tracked down and arrested about a month after uh, Vernon Butts's arrest. Gregory Miley was also arrested in Texas where he had fled after Bonin's arrest. So they got all of them. They got right. all the good. accomplices, which is good. It's hard to believe they couldn't trust <laughs> William Bonin. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> So the prosec one of the prosecutors for this case was Aaron Stovitz and was there a trial or did he just confess? Oh yeah, there oh, was okay. a trial. Oh, okay. Um, uh, one of the prosecutors was Aaron Stovitz who was on. Oh, the I know who that is. Team for the Tate LaBianca. Right, that's right. Right, and Stovitz actually said, "He's like I've fucking prosecuted some awful people, right. but this guy's literally the worst. He is the ever. worst." Like, he was, like, taken aback right. by this guy. And the police, when they were, uh, you know, listening to these horrible confessions and uh, looking at the evidence, they were sick. They were sickened by it. And right. uh, to a point that they had never, you know, seen anything of this magnitude. So um, Bonin had also said, you know, when uh, he was asked later by a reporter, why'd you do it? And he said, I like the sound of kids dying. So yeah, he this Ugh. is this is like totally there is not a shred of human no. empathy inside this person. The only good thing he did was turn in his accomplices. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So before Vernon Butts could testify against Bonin, he hung himself with oh. a towel in his jail cell. So the so he Vernon Butts is dead. Vernon Butts is fucking dead. Good. good. I mean, I'm just sad he didn't get murdered in prison. <laughs> right. 
The good news is there were, but Bonin was getting beat up in prison. So okay. that, that's, that, that makes me happy. Yeah. Um, uh, so Bonin's trial began in Los Angeles on November 5th, 1981. And on January 2nd, 1982, Bonin was found guilty of 10 counts of first degree murder. He was sentenced to death. But then Bonin was also tried again in Orange County because he committed a lot of murders there too. Right. He was found guilty on all four counts of murder that he was tried for and sentenced to death again. Mm -hmm. Double death. I thought that was interesting and you could be sentenced to death twice, but he was. All right. So Bonin was then sent to San Quentin where he sat on death row for over a decade. He was finally executed by... He was. Yes, by lethal injection on February 23rd, 1996. And his last meal was two large pepperoni pizzas, three pints of coffee ice cream, and three six-packs of Coke. No burger. I'm sorry. Why didn't he get the burger? I mean... Here's the thing I always wonder. I love... How could you eat that much food? This is what I... But you know what? I, I, I'm fascinated by last meals of yeah, of serial course. killers. Me too. Like... Uh, since I was a child, I've planned my last meal. Oh, yeah. Me too. Totally. Yeah. Uh, I've been fascinated by serial killer last meals forever. And, you know, John Wayne Gacy, he had the fried chicken. Mm -hmm. Like, he had, like, a shit ton of fried chicken and biscuits and gravy. They always order so much food. And I eat a lot of food. Me but too. I always just wonder, how much time are they given? Because I... It, right. I could mow down an entire large pizza by myself. Easy. But, like, if I'm I mowing like down break. two large pizzas, <clears throat> like, I need a few hours to do that. Well, there was a case in Texas, and that's when they stopped doing last meals, where someone ordered so much food. <laughs> they were still eating? No, that they, and then they threw it out. Like, they just did it as a, um, oh, that's as a, fuck whatever, you. as a fuck you. I mean, it was an insane amount of food, like, five times as much as what you just said right. about William Bonin. Right. So he was clearly doing it, so then they stopped giving last meals to well, people. Well, that guy just ruined it for everybody I else. know. I mean, honestly... Fuck them. I don't fucking care about the last meal. No. I hope that they don't get a last meal, but I do like hearing what they choose, especially when it's legit. Like, right. I like knowing what their last choices are. So like, I would love to just make them choose and then not give it to them. I'm fine with that too. Like, right. Uh, but yeah, it is a fascinating. Yeah, John Wayne Gacy, you don't get your fried chicken. Yeah, what, what would you love? Okay, no. <laughs> like, we just wanted to know. Psych. Like, I'm fine with that. Like, right, But totally. that you can't let the other killers know because we want them to keep doing it. And I'm also irritated by the serial killers who were like, I'll have a single olive. It's like, fuck you and your weird artsy shit. Right. Uh, what's your last meal? I mean, My last meal? I, I kind of change it all the time. When I was a kid, I wanted surf and turf. Um, <laughs> sorry. I wanted a Dairy Queen banana split. That was like my first last meal. Yeah. Now I don't know what I would choose. I love steak frites. Maybe I'd choose that. I don't know. I always go back to lobster too because I love right. lobster. So I would do like a whole lo full lobster dinner with like drawn butter and yeah. probably a side of French fries. Part of me is also like, see, I was like, even if I was a murderer on death row, I'd still be a food snob. So I'd be like, well, where are you getting the lobster? <laughs> Like, oh, I don't want yeah, red totally. lobster lobster. No, I don't want red it lobster. It needs to be good quality. I, Otherwise, I'll get a really good burger. Like, I need to know It what depends you're where I'm in jail or in prison. Right. I'm that, not going to get I'm not gonna get seafood if I'm in the middle of a landlocked state. Right. If I'm in Tennessee, I'm not getting the lobster. No, I'm going to get barbecue. I'll get barbecue. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I think about these things Me too, too. Desi. I think about Listen, these things I'm too. Listen, I'm planning what I'm going to get at a restaurant I'm going to for like three weeks from now. Oh my god! Like that's my thing. Oh yeah, no, I have. Plans I'm not going to murder anyone, but I to need go to know a restaurant and a restaurant I haven't been to uh, next week, and I've looked at the menu like five times right. already. Do you have any, excuse me? What are your specials two weeks from now? <laughs> oh, that I always want to. Yeah. Oh God. I almost don't want specials because I've already made my plan. And I don't need I get anything. So, I hate when I get me. thrown off. I'm like, wait, oh, <laughs> what do I do with? But you know, the specials it's always like swordfish. It's usually like, this is going to go bad. Let's throw that swordfish in a pasta. <laughs> like, Why is it always swordfish? I don't like swordfish. I don't either. It's tough. No. There's very few fish that I'm going to get, but I like shellfish. I love shellfish. I'll eat any shellfish. Me too. I love but all of like, it. It's like, I don't care. Sea bass, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> the only 
like fish fish and I, i'm not like i'm a, sure it's really good i just no i don't, I don't want it's there's something about it's not like buttery enough i'm never like i really could go for some sea bass right now Dude, <laughs> do you know what i'm saying like I i've never, never said that in my life no. <laughs> the only like fish fish that i'm like mm, is like the thin and crispy like a catfish or something or like fried yeah yeah i want that fried, fried. <laughs> Put some fried fish, if sure. If it's fried, I want it. If it's a fish fry, I'm down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna fucking get sea bass. No, I will like, never order sea bass. I would eat a pound of shrimp right now. Oh fuck yeah, <laughs> like shrimp I can eat. Shrimp. I bought two pounds of shrimp and made shrimp cocktail. I ate it for like two straight days. <laughs> I couldn't stop eating it. Dude, it's low carb. Excuse me, I made a really good dipping sauce. <laughs> I have what to was give it? it. I make up this sauce. It's kind of like um, what's it called with it's like I put capers and sriracha and like mayo. Like an aioli? <laughs> no, it's kind of like what's that sauce that they usually give you? A cocktail sauce? Like a cocktail. Like, uh, no, tartar it's sauce? Tartar sauce, but I make my own version of tartar Ooh. sauce with like capers and sriracha. So it's like red. It's like spicy. It's really Yum. good. <clears throat> oh, oh, my God. Good. Dude, it's like half shrimp, half sauce <laughs> on each shrimp. It's so good. Dude, I... I like how really? we're like talking about food right now because we're both starving. I'm so hungry right now. I had popcorn chicken before my show and it was really good and I was surprised that it was good, but mm. I only ordered it. I only ordered the food at the bar because I was like, I knew if I didn't eat something before I went on stage, I would probably pass out. Right. You had to. You I had to eat something. Do. But I was like in luck. It was actually pretty good. What happened to the other two murderers, by the way? Are they just in prison? They're still in prison. Okay. Yeah. So just the, the main two are dead. Yes. Good. Yeah, good. good. Fuck them. We hate them. Well, that makes sense maybe that I, why I didn't know about him because he was executed before I even was in yeah. California. Right. Uh, I, I'm just surprised because I do know so many serial killers that I didn't know this person. I he do. seems like one of the worst ones ever. I mean, that's what's shocking I'm to me. I'm always shocked when I find out about these ones that are seem so prolific but right. are not in the cultural consciousness. No, and I wonder if it's because his not that any murder is not traumatic but these are so horrible i just wonder so... if it's in some way easier to talk about like ted bundy's victims where it's just like he murdered them do you know what i mean like yeah this rape and their children it's just like people don't even want to go there go and... there in like a true crime kind of like oh i'm i love true crime it's like that's too much even right for an obsessed fan of true crime uh, I just, I had never heard of him right. before, uh, especially, I mean, I don't know. I, there are a lot of serial killers that out there that do not get talked about. Right. And um, we will be talking about the other two freeway killers at some point. And I actually made a list of Los Angeles serial killers and like our document of like show ideas. Yeah. And there's like 19. Yeah. I mean, it's insane. Right. I and know. You, you won't have heard of any of them. And some of them might not be big enough for their own show, but we could definitely do like um, a, a combo right. or something right. of a few of them. But yeah, it's insane. It's so. crazy. But it is interesting. I think um, I always am interested in hearing because I, you know, I know Ted Bundy really well. Right. I know John so Richard Casey. Ramirez and I like know all the main ones. Dahmer. Yeah. Like I know all those stories. So it's always fascinating to hear or read about these people who new stories yeah. uh that i haven't heard about before and they're not like on the shows no because that's where i'll see a lot of them i never heard of but right. this one's not even on. i've like, never yeah. even heard of this guy until recently so um okay well that's that. thank Do you have anything else no just join us on our facebook group yeah hollywood, hollywood crime, crime seed crime friends. friends we'll talk about this case and other cases and lots of fun things people share and lots of people yeah. have personal stories too so i wouldn't be surprised <laughs> someone maybe has something on this that we don't know about i mean I we've be, had some crazy ones i'd be interested to know if yeah. anyone had heard of him before or they right. were living in la at the time and they remember the story right so but the facebook group is good for that uh we do get a lot of really cool interesting stories from people right um, uh and then our other social accounts twitter and twitter instagram. and instagram we post pictures and whatnot yep. of the if you want to see what vernon butts looks like come on you know you want to see <laughs> we'll see a picture we'll post a picture of him uh-huh uh, cool. and that's it thank, thank you. you guys bye. so much bye i don't want no meat i don't want no meat just more taters.